so the question is how did the relationship between the United States and Israel have developed? What is the story of this relationship and, and what's the significance of the United States in shaping Israeli policy and, um, and the Middle East uh, in general? Uh, and I will focus on, on Israel uh, and I'll try to talk about this in a sort of chronological way, more or less. Um, the United States always had good relations with Israel, but with the state of Israel, but um, this can, can lead people to the false uh, assumption that the relationship has always been sort of steady, when in fact uh, it developed over the years. And it started um, when uh, the Israeli government, or the first Israeli government, uh, and also the various uh, Zionist uh, groups that established the state of Israel, even before the state was officially established, they were not sure uh, in the late 1940s if uh, the state of Israel will be allied with the United States or with the Soviet Union. That's something that's very easy to forget today. Uh, but because uh, the socialist uh, parties were the dominant parties within the Zionist uh, movement at the time, uh, many of them believed uh, that uh, there should be stronger relations between the state of Israel and the Soviet Union, uh, and the capitalist United States may not be the best ally for Israel. And in fact, uh, many years later, it became apparent that some very senior members of the Israeli military, the Israeli government, have actually given information to the Soviet Union during the Cold War because they did not agree uh, with this alliance with the United States. Uh, now, uh, nevertheless, it was the decision of President Truman to recognize the state of Israel. Uh, and that decision was taken very early and gave a lot of legitimacy to the state of Israel. Uh, and it was, in fact, uh, a very uh, important tool for the Israeli government to present itself as a legitimate state uh, and not just another colonial project uh, uh, in the Middle East by relying very heavily on the United States uh, support. Very interestingly, uh, this, this relationship between Israel and the United States remained relatively uh, calm and uh, or, or not, not, not a, a very close relationship, while the relationship between the uh, Jewish population of Israel and the Jewish communities in the United States was also somewhat of a tense relationship. Uh, it was a relationship where uh, Jewish communities in the United States, most of them were not Zionists, and they saw the state of Israel as a kind of social experiment that maybe will succeed, maybe will fail, but doesn't necessarily uh, bode well uh, to the prospects of, uh, of uh, their own uh, acceptance within the United States as equal citizens, because if they are associated with uh, whatever the state of Israel is doing, then of course uh, uh, their loyalty to the United States is questioned, or, and maybe uh, people get the impression that Jewish religion is somehow related to militarism and to war. Uh, so a lot of the kind of uh, dilemmas and, and problems that we see for Muslim communities today around the world when people associate them with the Islamic State, uh, then of course uh, they, they're not too happy about that. Um, but uh, all of this changed very dramatically in the war of 1967, in which, um, uh, also known as the, the Sixth Day War by the Israeli side, because uh, from the point of view of the Jewish uh, community in the United States, this war proved that the state of Israel is not a social experiment. The state of Israel is strong enough uh, to defend itself, to sustain itself, and that changed the relationship. It uh, changed the Israeli society from within because it uh, gave rise to a lot of messianic groups uh, which uh, saw the, the victory of the war as a, as a sign from, from heaven, a divine a sign that uh, God wants the state of Israel to grow and to succeed. Uh, and for some uh, uh, Jews in the United States, that was also this, uh, interpreted in such a way. And I guess from that moment, you can say that it's no longer so easy to say the majority of U.S. Jews are not Zionists. From that point of view, it becomes a bit unclear, and the, the Zionist groups within the United States become much more dominant and large. Although today, 
we see another change and and these groups if, if we jump 50 years later uh, again the Zionists do not have the majority anymore uh, but after the war of 1967 uh, the major arms supplier to the state of Israel which was France uh, decided that in order to maintain good relations with its uh, Arab uh, trade partners in the region it will stop providing weapons to Israel and uh, this was uh, uh, perceived in, uh, um, by, by the international community as an act by France to not support aggression within the Middle East, um, not giving weapons to the Israeli army is a good way uh, to, to not become complicit with war and also with war crimes. The United States saw it completely differently. The United States, uh, which had very good relations at the time uh, with Saudi Arabia, with Jordan, uh, and started to see the state of Israel as a possible major ally in the Middle East, maybe who would take the place of Saudi Arabia as the most important ally of the United States in the region in stopping Soviet encroachment. And so in stopping uh, countries that were supported by the Soviet Union, like Syria and Egypt. Now, the war of 1973 is a war where uh, Syria and Egypt, which at the time actually were, were united into one state. Uh, the, the, the two countries decided to merge into one state and declared war, uh, invaded uh, the state of Israel uh, and took the Israeli army by surprise and uh, supported with Soviet weaponry. They, the, the fight was not very clear who is going to win this war. And in fact, it became... Um, possible that uh, that the state of Israel will be defeated. In the middle of the war, the United States decided to take action and to clearly take sides and to start sending weapons to the Israeli side. And the U.S. weapons, uh, not only weapons, also other kinds of supplies, ammunition, um, have, have changed the course of the war and allowed the Israeli army to uh, push back the Syrian and Egyptian armies uh, to their starting positions. And uh, then uh, this, this, of course, became the major feature of U.S.-Israeli relations until today, the military aid. No other uh, aspect of that relationship has more impact on both of these countries than the military aid. We're talking about $3 billion a year on average. Initially, it was about two-thirds military aid and one-third civilian aid. Uh, and this $3 billion uh, have transformed the Israeli military, transformed the Israeli military industry. This is a topic for another discussion. Uh, but also, it had a lot of impact on the United States military industry. Because the Soviet Union and the, and the United States became the major suppliers of arms to the Middle East. In general, the United States uh, quickly realized that by selling weapons to the Israeli or, and by giving weapons for free to the Israeli army, they are, in fact, increasing their influence in the region and increasing the appeal that uh, uh, the U.S. weapons have. And Secretary of State uh, Henry Kissinger famously said, for every tank that we, the United States, give to Israel as a gift, the neighbors of Israel buy four tanks from the United States. So from that perspective, it's almost marketing, or not almost, it is marketing. Um, and this, of course, creates this impression that, okay, the, Israel is a kind of proxy for the United States in the Middle East. I, I also should suggest that we avoid this kind of uh, perspective. It also doesn't uh, give us a lot of uh, um, a, 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 the, the whole picture. Very interestingly, what happened to this aid over the years? I talked about $3 billion uh, on average, but uh, if we look on a long-term history of this aid, one thing that becomes very clear is that it actually went down over the years, um, which, which is maybe um, something that is a little bit uh, counterintuitive, because if you just look at the numbers, it seems to be going up. 
but uh, the rate of inflation is higher than the rate that it is going up. And if you look of what are what is the value of $3 billion, in 1973, $3 billion was such a, a, a tremendous amount that the Israeli military didn't even know what to do with all, all of this, all of these weapons. Um, and, and I should be very clear, this aid is not a cash. It's not, it's not given in cash. It's given in vouchers. The Israeli government has to use this money to buy weapons from U.S. companies. Uh, so $3 billion is a lot in 1973. $3 billion today is really not enough to cover uh, all of the needs of the Israeli military for U.S. technology. So now, on top of these $3 billion, which have grown to almost $4 billion, uh, over the years, uh, 3.8. But uh, in addition to that, uh, many, many billions are spent on buying the stealth bomber F-35 and uh, various uh, uh, components for airplanes and for tanks and uh, weapons, and, uh, uh, firearms and so on. So the $3 billion is no longer uh, enough. Also, the, a very interesting thing happened with the distinction between military and civilian aid, because in 1996, uh, then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, yes, uh, he's still the prime minister today, uh, uh, over 20 years later, um, but there was uh, a 10 year gap in his uh, uh, position as prime minister. Uh, and in his first term as prime minister, he went to the US Congress and said, Israel needs more weapons, please, uh, give us for one for every um, two dollars of civilian aid, we would like to have one dollar of military aid instead. So we're willing to accept less aid, but in exchange more weapons. The Congress uh, responded by saying, "Well, actually, uh, we have no problem to give it to you on a one-to-one -one basis because we want to uh, increase the the subsidy uh, to the weapon companies, and we want more weapons to reach." Uh, the Middle East. So um, since 1996 and until about 2012, the civilian aid has uh, gradually been diminished to the point where it is today virtually zero. There is almost no civilian aid anymore. It's all military aid. And it's military aid going directly to the US companies. There was a special aspect of that aid. Israel was the only country in the world which was allowed to take a certain proportion of that aid and use it to buy weapons from its own companies. For that purpose, Israeli weapon companies established subsidiaries in the United States and worked in close cooperation with US uh, companies in order to convince the, the White House, uh, the Congress and the Pentagon that, uh, for example, it will make it more likely that the Israeli army will buy more uh, F-16s if they're also allowed to buy the components that go with the F-16s from Israeli companies, for example, helmets for the pilots. So this kind of policy was, uh, was a special allowance only for the Israeli government. President Barack Obama, uh, shortly before leaving office, signed the Memorandum of Understanding for aid with Israel for the next 10 years. Interestingly, Obama, uh, th this, this Memorandum of Understanding was covered in the news as something very much pro-Israeli, a, a, a marvelous gift to the state of Israel, more aid than ever before. But that's not the whole story. The, the, a more accurate uh, description of this memorandum of understanding is that uh, there was a lot of tension between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Barack Obama, uh, and uh, Netanyahu was willing to sacrifice the good relations with the United States in order to gain various populist uh, domestic gains in his own government, for example, to go to speak to the Congress against the uh, very specific objection of President Obama to try to convince Congress to not to approve the Iran nuclear deal. And Obama, of course, would not allow such a thing to happen without some kind of revenge or some kind of uh, 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 response. The Memorandum of Understanding, uh, first of all, uh, even though it does speak about an increase in the total amount of aid, it actually doesn't catch up to the rate of inflation. So you look 10 years into the future, actually we're talking about a decrease in the long term. Second, uh, it uh, says that this 
special allowance for the for Israel to buy weapons from itself, that is going to stop gradually. Eventually, the, uh, Israel will no longer have this special privilege that no other country has. And uh, very important, uh, this memorandum of understanding also says that uh, the state of Israel is not allowed to make special appeals to the Congress during these this 10 year period and ask for emergency aid uh, uh, when when certain circumstances arrive. And this is a, a, something that the Israeli government did actually used to do quite a lot when there is something special happening, maybe an attack on Gaza or uh, or some uh, or on Lebanon, then they make an, an appeal. We need more weapons now. And the Congress often approves these special uh, requests. So now they will not be allowed to make the requests. In retrospect, because President uh, Trump was elected uh, and President Trump's uh, so-called America first policy is very um, clo closed bordered and very uh, self uh, centered. Uh, the memorandum of understanding signed by President Obama sort of changed it me its meaning retroactively because uh, Trump vows to uh, reduce U.S. aid to all of the countries in the world that receive aid from the United States. But because there is a memorandum of understanding with Israel, this gives him the excuse not to touch that kind of aid. And um, so Egypt, for example, has already seen reductions to their aid. Egypt is the second largest recipient of military aid from the United States in the world after Israel. But Israel's aid is untouched because there is the memorandum of understanding. So in a way, the uh, attempt of uh, Barack Obama to, uh, take, uh, to, to take a sort of uh, small revenge against Netanyahu backfired in a, <laughs> because, because the memorandum of understanding now protects uh, the, uh, Israel to receive this uh, smaller amount of aid. Uh, but uh, it, it could ev uh, still be better than what uh, Trump might have decided upon. Now, all of this aid tells us something very important. It tells us that for the United States, Israel is a, a country where um, military is being tested, US military equipment is being tested, military, military techno technology is being tested. Israel is an occupying power in the Middle East. It also uh, regularly launches attacks against neighboring countries, mainly against Lebanon. Um, but it also sends assassins against uh, senior members of the Hamas party or the Hezbollah in neighboring countries without any kind of uh, respect for, for borders or for international relations. And that sort of behavior uh, is something that, of course, creates a lot of tension and a lot of anger and a lot of conflict uh, in the Middle East, constantly um, feeding uh, various resistant groups within within the Middle East that uh, and, and uh, armed groups that are again and again saying, look at this aggressing, uh, aggression of, the, of Israel in the Middle East, an aggression which serves the purposes of the United States. And the United States has um, various reasons to want uh, the Middle East to continue to be divided and to have all of these factions fighting against each other. The most important reason why the United States would want such a thing is that it keeps the price of weapons very high and it keeps the price of oil very high. Uh, so these, uh, the, the lobby of the uh, arms companies and the lobby of the oil companies is playing a very more important role. And here I want to address this issue of the uh, Israeli lobby. First of all, um, some people call it the Jewish lobby, and that is a very racist uh, um, term, and I completely reject it. There is no Jewish lobby in the United States. There are many, many Jewish groups, uh, Jewish citizens in the United States who have many different political opinions like all other citizens of the United States, and there are Republicans and Democrats and so on. There is no Jewish lobby. There is. A, a ver an official lobby group promoting the interests of the state of Israel, and it's called IPAC, the American uh, Israeli Public Affairs Committee, IPAC. Uh, and uh, IPAC is a, an organization uh, which is uh, funded by the state of Israel uh, um, and op operating openly. There is no conspiracy about it. And the, but, but what is interesting is that if we look at the um, 
behavior of, of, of U.S. politicians, especially presidential candidates, towards IPAC, we see a, a behavior that can only be described as supplication. We see both, both candidate Obama before he became president and, and uh, Hillary Clinton um, on, on the, uh, in 2008 and again uh, in 2016. Uh, and of course, other candidates such as uh, Mitt Romney and uh, John McCain and, and so on, they uh, go to IPAC and give speeches of complete supplication, saying we will always support Israel. We believe that uh, Jerusalem should be uh, the capital of, of Israel forever, and we will. Uh, we promise that if we are elected, we will move the embassy uh, to Jerusalem. This is also a promise made by Obama, by the way, and he never did it, and uh, not just by Trump. And these speeches create this myth that the Israeli lobby somehow controls the White House and that the United States is a puppet of Israel. It's a, it's a myth that is, of course, a very dangerous myth. It, it directly leads to, to various racist conspiracy theory, these anti-Semitic um, ideas that uh, uh, the Jews control the world, because why would IPAC have so much power? One explanation is that IPAC has a lot of money and they are able to, to donate to candidates that they like and, and take away funding from candidates that they don't like, and that somehow can decide who gets elected in the United States. That is also completely false. It's absolutely false. IPAC has a budget, and the budget uh, is, uh, and, and uh, what any donations that they give to various candidates has to be registered officially. There are some ways in the United States, of course, to give money uh, indirectly and secretly, but, um, but IPAC doesn't have that much money to give. Uh, there is an, a website called opensecrets.org, and you can go there and see how much money different lobby groups give, and IPAC is there. You can see how much money IPAC is giving to various causes uh, of the Congress, and, and of course the main cause is pro-Israel. And it's not that, that much money. However, which other uh, lobby groups are willing to give money which is related to Israeli politics? Here we have the weapon industry. And here we have the oil industry, because like I said, whenever there is a lot of conflict in the Middle East and uh, whenever uh, Israel uh, refuses to end the occupation and continues to launch uh, attacks, it increases the price of weapons, it increases the price of oil. These companies profit a lot, but it's not possible for a presidential candidate in the United States to go to the lobby of Lockheed Martin, the arms company and say, don't worry, we will always make sure there is war in the Middle East. Of course, they can't do that. Uh, um, Lockheed Martin is one company. It has a, a, a lobby budget about five times bigger than IPAC. And Lockheed Martin is just one out of a series of companies, including Northrop Grumman and Raytheon uh, and Boeing and, and uh, General Electric, all of these giant military companies that profit from Israeli policies in the Middle East, but they, nobody wants to talk about this openly. And so it's much easier to talk to IPAC because this is acceptable and, and the media is willing to to just uh, put it in the framework of, of good relations between the United States and its allies. Uh, and uh, it's not, um, but unfortunately it contributes to those anti-Semitic uh, myths. Um, and I think that's something that, that for U.S. presidents is not such a big deal. Uh, uh, they don't care so much about the damage that it causes to um, how Jews are perceived as sort of agents of a foreign power, like all Jews are somehow agents of the state of Israel. This is the reason of what I talked about before. The Jewish community in the United States is not what it was in 1967, and it's not what it was in 1948. Now there is a growing awareness to this problem. And in fact, if we talk about um, one of the most important movements for Palestinian liberation um, in, in the world, that is the boycott movement, the BDS, Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement. And in the United States, we have to recognize this fact that even though the BDS movement is a call by Palestinians and it's a call for accepting Palestinian rights, Palestinian groups within the United States are the minority within the BDS movement. The biggest organization in the United States supporting BDS is, is the Jewish Voice for Peace. This is a strange situation 
that the Jewish Voice for Peace, a Jewish organization, is supporting Palestinian rights in greater numbers than all, any other organization currently working in the United States. Because for American Jews, they understand that the end of the colonialism and the apartheid which exists in Israel-Palestine is not just an interest of the Palestinians, but it's also part of their own struggle within the United States to uh, be uh, legitimate citizens, to be uh, not to be complicit in promoting and funding war and oppression of people.